All right. Hi, yeah. I'm Rachel Carlson. I'm a freshman and I'm a member of IFF's industry team. I'm Judama Perez Hinojosa. I'm a senior at Brown and one of IFF's programming coordinators. We're here with John M. Chu as a part of IFF's digital speaker series. Hi, John, John M. Chu. Uh, John M. Chu is known for his visually stunning blockbuster films, as well as his kinetic work across various genres, from groundbreaking series to commercials and films. Most recently, he directed the worldwide phenomenon Crazy Rich Asians, which was nominated for numerous awards, including a SAG Award, a Golden Globe, and PGA Award, and was one of the top 10 highest grossing romantic comedies of all time. It was the first contemporary studio picture in more than 25 years to feature an all Asian cast and represents a new chapter in Chu's 10 year career. This year, Chu helmed his most ambitious project to date, the highly anticipated adaptation of Lin-Manuel Miranda's Tony Award winning musical In the Heights for Warner Brothers Studios, for which I was a additional production assistant. He also recently yeah. served as an, <laughs> as an executive producer and director on Home Before Dark, a series for Apple starring Jim Struges and Brooklyn Prince, inspired by the true story of 11-year-old investigative reporter Heil Lisiak. Chu's previous credits include Step Up to the Streets, G.I. Joe Retaliation, Justin Bieber's Never Say Never, and many more representing true. over $1.3 billion in the worldwide box office. Additionally, his unique storytelling ability has earned him the honor of being on the Hollywood Reporter's 100, Power 100 list, as well as Variety's new Hollywood leaders. In addition, John would like to use this time to promote Dine 11, which is organizing free restaurant meals for frontline healthcare workers during this time. And It Takes Our Village, a GoFundMe campaign supporting behind the scenes entertainment workers. So John, we wanna start off by asking about Dine 11 and It Takes Our Village and hearing a little bit more about why you've been drawn to those organizations right now. Um, well, it takes our village specifically because it's our, uh, you know, our crews, uh, the people who make movies possible. You know, I get to, uh, I'm, I get to work with some of the most creative people in the world who, uh, from the uh, from the production designers, the builders, the people who paint and um, the editors and sound people. And there's just so many people, as you all know, um, and, uh, and they're out of work right now. They're not able uh, in social distancing to make movies right now and uh, we want to support them and when you are home and watching stuff uh that's how essential they are because they're keeping you entertained and keeping your spirits high during this difficult time so i want to support them there's a gofundme page to support them and and that fund goes directly uh to uh some of the the actors fund and a couple other funds that uh that are out there to, to help support this this gap in time uh, and Dine uh, 111 um, is uh, you know i've come from a, a restaurant family so i know how difficult uh, my, my parents' restaurant's 50 years old, so they've had to now, they're, they're, they're changing things up to do drive through right now, so it's been, uh, it's been, it's been tough, so uh, any way we can support local restaurants is, is, is a good thing. Yeah, it's awesome that you have that personal connection, um, and we also, if anybody's mm -hmm. interested in checking um, either of those organizations out, we've linked them in our Facebook pages. Thank um, you, thank you. Yeah, no, um, we love that you're supporting them. Um, so moving on to your filmography, Crazy Rich Asians, as I mm -hmm. mentioned, was really the first film of its scale um, in 25 years to feature an all Asian cast. Um, and because of its success, both critically and commercially, many look to you as one of um, the champions of the movement to increase um, representation and reshape the narratives of people of color in Hollywood. Um, so we just want to know how this responsibility has informed some of your directorial choices in projects since then, like in the Heights. Um, and just the mm -hmm. way that you think about your directing and film. Well, interestingly, one, it's great to be here. Thanks, uh, guys, for having me. I was uh, never too smart to get into Brown, so uh, or any Ivy League. I went to film school, so it's that's it's nice to to be around smart smart young people. <laughs> um, that said, in terms of um, what Crazy Rich Agents did to me and how it changed for me, it's in a weird way, it kind of happened before, like um, I was finishing up a movie with some big movie stars. I've been making movies for you know 10 years now. And um, and, and actually Rachel's father, uh, I don't know if I should say this, but uh, is my agent uh, and found me when I was in college. So 
uh, he and he didn't have to. He has other much bigger clients, especially at that time. And uh, and so I've been very been very lucky. And but but when you get sort of plucked from college, you get thrown into the movie studio world, and you're very lucky. I didn't have to PA. I didn't have to direct other things. I went right into studio movies. Um, when you're that young, it's great. But at the same time, you don't really know who you are as an artist, or you're changing so quickly. You're growing up. Um, and so for many movies, uh, I learned a lot, and these are some of my favorite sort of uh, projects. Uh, uh, but at the same time, um, I was growing up. And so there are certain points where uh, I, I realized that I wasn't doing movies that necessarily I was contributing to the cinema um, as a genre. And at, you know, when I'm getting close 40 years old at the time I was going through this, I realized I wanted to, to take more risks, do something that was more scary for me. Um, and I knew I had sort of the opportunity to get something made um, because my movies had made enough money and I had enough relationships that I could probably force one through. Uh, and so I wanted to do the scariest thing that I, which was do a movie about my cultural identity crisis. But I didn't want it to be my own story. So we found Crazy Rich Asians, a, a great book, a really fun, uh, fluffy book but in there was director Rachel Chu, Asian American, going to Asia for the first time, which I found very compelling um, because that was that has been my um, yeah, I remember experiencing that going to Taiwan for the first time, going to Hong Kong for the first time, which my mom and my dad are from both places. So when um, they came from to America much later, so for me as an Asian American, uh, sort of on the cusp of these two worlds. Um, the last thing I really ever wanted to do going into the movie business was make a movie about that issue because one, I didn't, I didn't want to be seen as that and be labeled as that. As we know, once you put that label out there, everyone wants to box you in. But two, I didn't know the answers. I didn't know if anyone else felt like this, and I felt silly. You know, when you when you don't feel like you fit into either world, you feel like whatever you say is going to piss somebody off. And so I was scared. But but at this point in my career, I was like, let's do it. Like this is the this is the time. Like. Um, and there were a lot of people out on the internet uh, with Twitter and stuff voicing opinions about certain things in Hollywood. And I realized I had the power to actually, I'm on the front lines. I can actually make a decision and change those things. I didn't have to go to someone. I didn't have to protest something. I could just do it. Um, and, uh, and so when, and, and at the same time I found In the Heights. So both projects I actually sent to at the same time because I was in the same space and within the Heights, even though I'm not from Washington Heights, um, and I am not Latino, uh, it, it, uh, it ultimately, the, the story, I remember watching it on Broadway, was so compelling as a story of America, of this immigrant community. I grew up in a community of immigrants who came to California not knowing the language and had to build, my mom's one of six kids, so all my uncles raised us, took care of us, fed us. Um, and so I loved seeing that in another community and I, I immediately understood what it meant to have an abuela, um, like Abuela Claudia. I, I immediately know the, knew the pressure, what it meant to go to college and feel this pressure that they have fought for you to succeed. And what does that mean when you go to college and you don't even know yourself trying to figure that out? So both projects came at the same time. And then once Crazy Rich Asians obviously hit, it was, um, it was great. I didn't know that people were actually gonna go see it. I just thought we were making something that we had to make. And the fact that people showed up and it changed a lot of things in the business and con continuing to, um, it just reaffirmed that there is a place for our voices. There is um, a new lane for new filmmakers and storytellers. And that was very exciting. And that was ultimately as theaters and movies struggle, I think part of the solution is these new voices. Yeah, no, that, um, I mean, talking about belonging and labeling um, and acceptance mm -hmm. and also then grappling with your identity, I think leads actually really well into one of our audience questions um, from a PhD mm -hmm. candidate in media studies at SUNY Buffalo, Azalea Mutrancia. Um, and she says that your film has opened up doors for other Asian and Asian American filmmakers in the industry and um, says, however, I agree with actor John Cho that the coronavirus pandemic has reminded Asian and Asian Americans that our belonging is conditional. How do you think this mm -hmm. racism towards Asian and Asian Americans will impact representation and more importantly, agency to tell um, those stories um, in Hollywood? Well, I hope it doesn't change the, the momentum we are on. 
I, I don't think I think the voices are, are are have have the box is open. You can't put it back in. We are here. The talent is here. Um, so so I hope it doesn't affect how that is. Although I do think um, it only sort of reaffirms the importance these perspective of these um, cultural leaders um, that have a microphone to speak out, to stand up for others. You know, so many years, the reason I was scared to ever talk about it was because it you grow up in a environment where you're taught not to be a pest, not to complain, not to make a big deal because I was always taught to just like, Prove it in your work. Prove it in your work, and 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 I'm glad I did because it made me focus instead of focus on um, feeling like a victim all the time or feeling consumed in this other thing. But there is a balance. At the same time, if you don't bring it up, if you're not making a deal of it, you know people uh, people think they can get away with it. And so I am, uh, you know, I am growing into my me being comfortable of uh, of speaking out. Um, and that's hard because I am used to a certain way of keeping my head down, just making movies. Um, so I think that this, this wave of racism that's happening right now um, is a reminder that um, it's not over and that we, and we have to be consistent in our voice and our path. Um, and it shows the strength, how much more we need to keep doing. And these stories will help bridge those gaps to make people realize there is a difference. One, we're all human beings um, and, we, and diseases don't, or viruses don't care what color your skin is or where you're from. Um, and, and two, that we, we have a responsibility to take care of, of each other during that. And there, and there is a difference between Asian American identity, which I think is, I've always known, but I didn't know how many were actually out there. As a kid, you think I'm the only one or my family may be the only one that is American through and through, but, um, but at the same time, have a Chinese roots and cultural roots that we, we respect and are also a part of. Now with the internet, with YouTube and everything, we see so many Asian Americans who went through that same experience. And so, we're really defining what Asian, what it means to be Asian American now. And that, that actually has a lot of different folds and a lot of different ways. So um, we're sort of building what, what, what that identity is. And so I think that comes with conversation. And, um, and also we have to be able to forgive each other for some of the things that we may say that don't necessarily fit into what other people think of what Asian American is. I think that that, that is part of us all defining how we want it to be to the world is we have to have a debate and we have to say things and we have to talk out loud to, in order to find the path. Um, and then we can inform the rest of the world of how we want to be treated, how we think what an Asian American means and is. Um, and it doesn't mean this one thing or this one thing, it means this plethora of ideas and things. So anyway, that's my long answer of, um, I don't know, but um, I, I hope that it just, uh, I'm really glad that we have the internet that has really uh, brought our voices together and not separate voices. Um, and, and that, but we actually have an army now um, to be able to combat these things. Um, and we're not at our full strength yet, but but we'll get there. Um, and so these are these are just good tests for us. Uh, building I'm not saying it's good that's happening. By the way, I'm just saying, you know, these are these are moments where where we can really utilize uh, the network. Yeah, that's that kind of leads into another question from one of the audience members, a sophomore at Brown, uh, Dana Karaniawan. I will probably mispronounce that, but I also have a difficult to pronounce name, so forgive me, Dana. Um, they asked, as a Singaporean Indonesian American, Crazy Rich Asians, aside from being a groundbreaking cast, was so special because it created a dialogue between being Asian American and Asian and American. It's a subtle contrast, mm -hmm. but it's one you, John Chu, consider with so many layers and so much depth. So did similar considerations of what it meant or what it means to be a recent immigrant slash bi-continental, bi-dialectical um, affect your making of In the Heights? 
Uh, yes, 300%. Um, a little different from Crazy Rich Asians. From Crazy Rich Asians, like, I knew what it felt like to be Asian American and going to Asia. I was a very personal um, feeling that I could communicate through our tools in cinema. I knew what it felt like to respect music that came from China, that came from Taiwan, that came from Hong Kong. Um, I understood the difference between what you know people in Singapore think about all the different Asian countries around, and all the because because this is an island that people come to, so it's a it's a it's it's a lot of different types of Asians from all around the world that come into that. When it came to and so and and, and so I learned a lot as well. I could have one perspective and then I learned a lot and tried to communicate that in the movie. It's not perfect, but we tried to do as much as we can. And in the Heights, I was much more of an outsider of that. So I really was focused on um, listening a lot. Um, and luckily we have the best guides in the world and the best communicators uh, in Lynn and Kiara, who, uh, who Kiara wrote the original book on for Broadway and also uh, adapted it for the screen with us. And we got really, really close with them. They both live in Washington Heights. So um, I could, and we had a great uh, crew and people a part of it. And, and we had an open dialogue. We tried to, and I don't know, uh, I don't know how you felt, but I really tried to make the set um, a place where people could say what they felt at the time. Um, so if an actor said, hey, the sauce is on the table, are not what would actually be on the sauces um, at our family table. I wanted to have that discussion and I wanted to take the time. Usually you're on a film schedule, you're going, 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 going. You don't have time for those conversations. You don't have time to figure out, hey, she would have curly hair and it'd be all like, and then, and then your lighting guy's like, we can't because there's shadow and you're not going to see your eyes and your camera guy's like, the angle and the hair is going to be in the way. And this one, we're like, no, the hair is important. It's an important part of this, um, of the story of her identity. Um, so we are gonna stop and readjust the camera and readjust the lighting to fit that. I think um, it was a lot of listening, but also giving room for us to discover or to discuss the things that needed to be discussed. Um, and yes, um, there are, uh, I, and I honestly coming into the movie um, did not know all the sensitivities of the differences of all the Latin American countries and cultures and all, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot there. Um, and Kiara and Lynn uh, helped me, guide me through those. But in the end of the day, they always told me it wasn't about, this movie is not, and about this block specific, it's not about the differences between being Dominican and Puerto Rican and Cuban. It's about what they actually all share. Um, and so that really helped me. Um, so I didn't have to get caught up in, you know, of course the specifics we needed to make very clear if someone's household was from one place for another, some mixed, then we needed to reflect that. Uh, but the message of the movie is where we all connect. And that really helped me focus on that in terms of the, in terms of the narrative of the movie. Right. 100%. And, and, and by of, the way, I don't, I still don't know anything. Every, every time we edit the movie, you know, I get feedback and I have to listen and take it in and, and, and we try to make adjustments and things. So, uh, and I'm sure people see it, they'll have certain opinions and we'll never get hundred percent. Right. But again, that's the only reason we have to create a lane so that more stories, this is not the only story that represents that other perspective, other ways can come in uh, and present all of that. So. Right. And kind of speaking to the future of the impact of In the Heights, potentially. Recent studies have revealed yeah. that, that COVID-19 disproportionately affects Black and Latino communities at an alarming rate. And from obviously from my experience on set, In the Heights was and will be an incredibly hopeful film that celebrates these communities yeah. in particular. So what sort of impact do you hope the film can have on these audiences and beyond, especially um, as it's premiering next year uh, in the wake of the pandemic? Yeah. I just want to see I just want to show people human beings. Mm -hmm. And I and I feel like, um, you know, I think about a story when my, when I was a young, when, uh, when I was young, my parents would pack dumplings for me in my lunchbox and I would go to school and it would smell up the locker and uh, all my friends would make fun of me 
And I, so I eventually would dump the food before I got to school and then I would come to school. I was barely, this is like first or second grade. And then my mom one day was like, hey, dad and I signed up for Chinese New Year's to present what Chinese New Year's is to your class. And I was like, oh no, that's like the worst. My parents are coming and they're going to present like Chinese New Year's to my friends who I know don't give a, don't give it anything to this. I was so worried. And then they came in and they brought, um, you know, they brought like the, the, the lion dancers with, you know, the costume thing. And they had their chefs like in it and they danced around and had drums. And then they had these red envelopes with uh, gold coin, like chocolate coins inside. And they brought Chinese food to their restaurant. And, and at the end of it, my friends were like, your parents are the coolest being Chinese is so cool. Like we wish we could come and eat chocolate, gold chocolate at your house all the time and dance around. And so I suddenly became like cool. And what it just reminded me was like, oh, it's the fear of the unknown that is more dangerous than just knowing that it's like different cultures are interesting and, 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 and you don't have to make more or less of that. Like it is. Um, and when you show those things and we show on those things, you don't have to teach a lesson. Um, people are inherently um, curious about that and, um, and will feel the love of that. So in, in my head, I hope, my hope is that people just see joy in this community that they may pass by every day or may pass by um, the taxi driver or the guy at the elevator and think that that's just what they are. But that's not what they are. They have families that they're supporting. They have communities that they are um, taking care of. Um, and I just think that's so beautiful. And so in our opening shot of the movie or the opening number, we end, and usually the opening number, you end on the big wide shot of the whole street dancing. But in our movie, we do the opposite. We see the whole street dance and we descend in. And you can actually pick anybody on the block and tell their story and be like, this person, but instead we pick this one guy who owns a bodega on the corner and we move in on him. And, um, and we get to show throughout the movie that his story is just as grand, is just as magical, is just as epic as any king, story about a king in Egypt or England or wherever, any great story that Hollywood ever told, their dreams, their hopes um, are, deserve just as much space and, and, and presentation is that. That's why I think when we were posed during this time to, uh, or poised to, to sort of release it, just streaming to get it to people, I really resisted that. Nothing against streaming, love streaming, watch stuff all the time on it. But for this movie in particular, putting it on the big screen, making people say, make, like having a giant company like AT&T, Warner Brothers, spend tens of millions of dollars to market these actors, and this community and say, it's worth you, the public's time to leave your house, pay $20 or however much it costs, drag your friends, uh, fight through parking, sit in a dark room and watch these people show you their neighborhood. It's worth that to you. To me, that you cannot emulate in any other medium and have the access point where people can go to their local theater like that. There's no medium like that in the world. And so for me, for the story in particular, it was very important to send that messaging to me. It is important, go see it. So that's what, um, that's that's a big reason and part of the reason we, I, I ever wanted to make this. Incredible, yeah. Uh you kind of spoke to it just now, but In the Heights was such a massive production with so many moving parts, so many dancers, yeah. so many you know musical numbers just more logistically as a director, what was your strategy for managing all of these elements as, at once? And what tactics do you find the most instrumental to successfully leading such a large production? I know you've, you've had other yeah. musical movies in the past, but like, where do you, how do you drop in, in a sense? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of details to answering that question, if you know sort of the filmmaking process, but as a general, I am a big believer in process. Um, that you don't have the answer up front, but that you're going to find the answers as you go. At the same time, you have to have a vision for everyone to follow. So when I, for In the Heights, for instance, I, re I think about the things that I want to communicate most, or the things that moved me most from the show. 
this idea that home is where you are. Home is where your loved ones are. This idea of finding home. Everybody defines home in different ways. Some people have to go find their home. Other people don't recognize their home. That's right in front. Other people have to build their home and bring their community to that. Either way, I, that was a very powerful part in the show for me. On top of that, in the movie, um, I really you know, wanted to bring um, this uh, truthfulness to it, that it wasn't a show, even though it's a musical. These are real human beings and these struggles have real consequences. So anything that felt too theatrical, I wanted to like really make it um, grounded in that way. But at the same time, grounded doesn't mean you don't have magical moments in their head when they imagine what their life is, it can, it can be very, very grand. So I focus on that. And then it's about communicating to every single one of my departments, production design, costumes, makeup, uh, Kiara, writer, even, even music, scoring, and, it's, and actors. And I communicate the bigger vision we're trying to tell, not necessarily the details, not saying, hey, this scene has to be this way. In this scene, I need red. In this scene, I need purple. Instead, I say, this is what I'm trying to create. I need her to be fearful of this neighborhood at first. And then when she gets in, she gets seduced by it. And then she gets whatever. So, and, and then they, as experts in their field, can interpret what that means. So it's about giving them a destination, but not directions um, in a way. Um, it's the same thing when I work with an actor. It's a scene that we're working on. I don't say, um, I need you to turn your head left and then blink twice. I say, I, I want you to, I want to feel, I want to, um, I want your heart to break when he tells you he can't come to your show. How would you, how would you, but I don't want you to show him that your heart is broken. Now us as an audience will watch that performance and know exactly how that feels. And she doesn't have to say one word. I can't tell her, the actor, how to do that uh, other than, hey, this is the emotion that I think that character's feeling, whatever way that character would give it. And so those, to me, it's like every department has its own process. And I don't try to freak out and be a controller about everybody's thing. I try to be a, a net um, that sort of gets everybody on the boat, or sort of captures everyone into the same region and says, let's move this thing together. Um, and so I believe in process. I believe in the first time's rarely the right thing. Usually you have to get past the first four or five ideas that come to the top of your head and then the good ideas come. So I believe in fostering an environment of process um, and trying it, trying it again, fixing things, and then, and, then, and then always checking back about the original destination which you're going. So sorry if that's not specific enough, but that's sort of as, you're doing choreography, dance. Of course, there's all technical things in all of those. But I, um, as a director, my my job is not to tell people how to run the camera or how to teach them how to do a dance move. I don't know anything about that. My thing is use your expertise to paint this picture portrait of, of these people that we're trying to paint. And they're like, got it. And when you hire the right people, they know what they're doing. And you hire the wrong people, that then you know, then then everything gets off. So, another <laughs> TED talk. <laughs> I mean, I think what's so impressive about all of that and in all of your work really is the attention to detail um, and really just the feeling that you give anybody who goes to see anything that you've worked on. Um, and you touched mm. on sort of that fine line between theatrics um, and having your work feel grounded, which I think um, leads us to a different audience question um, from one of IFF's directors, Grace Atanasio, a Brown junior. Um, and she was wondering about the process of adapting a Broadway musical into a film um, and talked about how you've worked on films that have had both live and produced um, performance components. Um, so we just were wondering mm -hmm. if you could talk a little bit more about the process yeah. of working yeah. on In the Heights. Um, so yeah, I, I got on In the Heights about four years ago. There was a script, because the script's been for like 10 years or something. So it was at another studio, then another studio. And by that time I got it, um, Kiara had done a great job, but they were missing pieces to get it fully across the line. And so I, when they send it to me, they say, hey, would you be interested? And they don't offer it to me. They just say, would you be interested in directing a movie on In the Heights? Um, 
And then I look at the script and I break it down and then I, and then I present to Kiara and Lynn and, uh, uh, and our producers who were on it before. And I tell them, this is how I'd make this movie. Here's what I changed in the script. Um, in the, here's what I changed in the musical numbers. They're not gonna be just on the block. Like I would, instead of making it bigger, I would actually go more internal because I think people's hopes and dreams actually are bigger than actual events in the real world. So we can actually like blow that out. And I think that dance isn't the only thing that music and dance isn't the only thing that communicates or expresses what they're feeling at that moment. I think you can add weights and, uh, and physical environments that then shift according to how they feel. Because if we're in a world where they're just expressing how they feel in sort of movement poetry, then, then we should be able to allow those rules to, to extend to everything else in their world for those moments. Then I, um, uh, and then we look at the songs and say, there's just too many songs. Unfortunately, you have like 20 something songs and we have, you know, we're trying to get a two hour movie, something around, around there. Uh, and then you start to look at what does a movie, because a, a structure of a, of a play is very different. It has, you know, different acts, breaks, different expectations of your audience. So you have to adjust accordingly, you know. So uh, then we break it down of, hey, are we missing any beats from the show that should be in this, you know, thing? And, and or, hey, is this, what is this story ultimately about? It's about Usnavi, our main character, um, and how uh, he, his, his, his story about, a block that disappeared, um, and so, uh, so if if that's the arc, then every and only the songs that support that journey should be in this movie. And so we free ourselves of anything that doesn't go with that that feels extraneous. And then, as you do it again, trusting the process, I think, is really important. I think we're taught in school. I think we're taught in sports that the destination is the goal destination is if you don't have if you don't accomplish and have the and you and, and flip the switch then you are not making progress but in fact I don't think that's how art works I don't think that's how life works I think it comes in waves and I think it's all about process and figuring things out so you can often feel um, uh, you can often feel disillusioned or, or or feel like you're not getting the job done because you don't have an instant results where in fact you're just in stage one of six stages and then you have to get past that first stage to get to the sixth second to third fourth five five six so that is um so again we keep building on this for the stage show dance was a component of the show of the broadway show but but to me dance uh can would be a bigger place in the movie um so i brought on my team to come in and interpret what this all is we talk about ideas, I draw it out on storyboards, we go like, and then we also check in with Lynn and say, hey, here's what we're doing. Um, any, anything that we, that, that is, that is you, you think we should change or shift, and then he adds his opinion. So it's just a constant building on top of each other. Um, and then obviously when the actors come, they have, they bring their own stuff. And then when we cast is a huge element, the cast is gonna be your paintbrush. Uh, and so we took a lot of time to cast it right. So. I don't know if that answered the question other than it's a whole process. No, totally. And it's I really think. fun doing a musical because you get the you get the excitement of doing live show. You get because you do playback and some of it's live singing as well. You have actors that can do that, cameras that can follow and do all that. But at the same time, you get the amazing thing about film, you can edit it, or you can do another take, or you can be two inches from their face and then <laughs> ten thousand feet in the air. In a, in, a, in a theater show, you can't do that. So we try to take advantage of those differences. Going off of the idea of like how you work with your actors, two of our audience members, uh, Maya Bulcheta from Rhode Island School of Design, class of 22, and Mika Shevchenko, Brown, a senior at Brown, asked if there's something in particular you tell your actors um, that's key to getting the rep like the best performance from them or how you kind of work with them when maybe things aren't going in the direction you envisioned. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I try to be as truthful as possible to my actors. That's all they want. If, you're, if you start to bullshit them, like, hey, we're gonna start in five minutes, knowing that you're gonna start in 15 minutes, they're, they're not gonna trust you. And, 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 and having a relationship 
where the actor is going to let you in. And you, by the way, represent the camera. You represent the audience. You have to have a very close relationship and a trusting relationship that they can um, make mistakes and you're going to tech them on that. And you want them to get to a point where they're going to make mistakes because that means they're pushing themselves that much harder, at least in my opinion. Sometimes they nail on the first one, like we don't need to do anymore. But I think pushing people to the brink of going overboard is great because then you know your limits, then you can pull it back. Otherwise you're, you're sort of flying blind. You don't know how far you can actually go with this stuff. So there is a trust. I have that conversation right from the top with all my actors. Like, let's play, let's have the conversation. I'm never gonna tell you what to do. I, I needed to come from this character, but let's talk about the character first. Let's talk about where they're from. Let's talk about who they are. Let's talk about their insecurities. Let's talk about what they need, what they want. Once we form that algorithm of that character, then you can throw a million different things at that character and you can process it through the algorithm and you know the answer. Um, of course, some things don't fit the algorithm and, and I'll give you some magic that you could have never predicted. But I think tackling each scene with an actor um, through the lens of this, template that you've built for this character, knowing that it can evolve and change, I think is key. Um, but on the day of shooting, know that the best stuff you didn't have. And so always keeping, it's almost like improv. Hmm. The day of shooting, I find so exciting because all your conversations, all your notes meetings mean nothing on this day. It's whatever happens. And so you just, you're, pl you're, 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 you're playing improv with each other. They're doing something, they're turning their shoulder a certain way. So I'm like, if I move the camera this way, that that window is gonna be right there and it's gonna be beautiful. She's gonna be in silhouette when she tells the truth or when she lies or whatever maybe. Or when, um, okay, if uh, she wants to bend down on this and I didn't plan on having anything on the floor, but listen, if she's on the floor, then suddenly that scene's gonna be really intimate. It's gonna be under the table. So then I, t then I work with my production on, hey, let's, let's make sure that table has tablecloth so they can be actually uh, in private. Uh, and then, hey, let's put that light under the table so that it glows and we can see them in silhouette from the outside. So it's a constant, like, when you get confident at the craft of making a movie, then you get to play improv with your actors and make things that you could have never planned and seem ridiculous if you ever wrote down. That's when you know you have something unique and only you could have done on this particular day with particular people. Yeah, I mean, I think in thinking about becoming more confident as you um, gain experience and earlier you sort of talked about how you kind of started right out of college. Um, mm -hmm. I think something that a lot of maybe young creative people are thinking about right now is how, especially during this time, things like filmmaking and just creativity in general have um, maybe been placed on a bit of a back burner. Um, so we were wondering if you had any advice or things to say to young young directors and filmmakers who are still hoping to get their work out there right now and in the coming years. Yeah. By the way, what you're saying about confidence is interesting because I think uh, confidence doesn't mean you have a lack of fear. Confidence is, I think, a trust of a process um, that you, that that you'll find some answer in the end of the end of the day. I'm fearful every day I go onto that set, and that can stop people. And that used to stop me. Um, and I've now started projects from thin air so many times that um, it's less precious to start. Whereas when I first started, it was like this is my movie. I've got to write the most amazing sentence ever. I've got to shoot the most. I've got to have this vision that is. And you actually don't. You're a human being. Great if you're a genius. Congratulations, it's gonna be real easy for you. But most of us aren't. So you gotta start. And starting means um, getting it out of your head. If it's in your head, it doesn't exist. By the way, everyone and their moms, you know, uh, is creative in their head and has the most amazing movie in their head and, uh, and will, will give their opinion to you in their head, all that stuff. But you as a creator, the difference between you and someone else is you take it from here to here. Um, and, and that also doesn't mean writing words. It can be painting, it can be music, it can be whatever it is. Um, just do it. That sounds, it is, a, I guess it is a, a, a slogan, but they were right. They're really right in that, um, that you, you are, I, I always say this, but you are what you do every day is the advice that I got when I was uh, getting into the business. I was like, how do you become a director? 
like no one's going to give you permission. No one gives you like a card and say, congratulations, you're a director. Dire being a director is very similar to being an entrepreneur. Like you either are, or you are, you're, you don't get hired to be an entrepreneur. You're either starting a company or you're not. You don't get hired to be a producer. You're either getting the elements together to make something or you're not. Writing, you're not getting hired unless you're already writing. So you should be writing every day, whatever you're doing, that's who you are. And if you say you're a writer and you're not writing every day, you're probably not a writer. Uh, and if you say you're a director and you're not willing to grab the camera and go find stories and go make stuff, uh, especially now with the access, you're probably not exactly a director. You can love movies, but it doesn't make you a director. And so I think it's physicalizing your creations. That is a huge thing and probably the biggest thing that stops most people from doing it. They can't get out of their head or get out of the fear of just starting. You will not be perfect. That's fine. But you'll find your way. So that would be a beautiful note to end on, but to end on something a little less serious and a little bit more fun and jovial. Um, um, <laughs> of the, Was that like, depressing? Was that dark and depressing? No, 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 no. 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 <laughs> No, that was not depressing. That was very hopeful, but we, we wanted to throw in a more kind of fun, yeah. spicy question. Just, um, of the more recent- I did watch film, Tiger King, yeah. Okay, that's actually our question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of, the recent, of the recent films uh, and TV shows you've watched or books you've read, what is the art that has inspired you to look to the future or that honestly you've just been enjoying? <laughs> um, well, I did watch- Tiger King, I am watching uh, The Last Dance, which is fantastic. If you aren't watching it, you should be. Um, I am fascinated. Well, I mean, listen, TikTok, it's craziness. I'm too old to be on TikTok. I don't do TikToks, but I watch TikToks. And I, it really brings a lot of, um, uh, I, I love seeing people's talents. They, there's so many talented people out there. And I think that, uh, TikTok allows you to see it and they're so creative. Um, there's no lack of creativity out there. And that, that's really exciting for me. Um, but I have to admit, I know I have two kids, one's um, uh, almost three and one's eight months. So I've been, um, uh, my attention has been going to them a lot and finishing in the Heights, which we're not quite done yet. So I'm trying to finish that all up. Incredible. Love, love promoting TikTok to. to so more basically, people. yeah, what Sorry. we've learned is TikTok is the future. I <laughs> know, uh, my bad, my bad. No, no, no. Not watching TikTok. I think... not watching this right now, actually. So it's okay. <laughs> I think it's honest and truthful, and it's where a lot of creative people are right now. So yeah, <laughs> I love it. Those are my people, people who just make stuff. I love it. It's honestly, it's probably a great place to go if you're feeling creatively jolted because you just have to go and yeah. make things, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. 100%. Well, that's that's what we have. Unless, Rachel, you have anything awesome. you want to you throw no, in No, unless, unless you have anything you feel like you want to add. Um, that's it for us. No, other than I'm, I'm, really, um, I'm really encouraged by... Uh, the new generation that's out there and the people who are making things or have the aspirations to everyone out there who ha who has been thinking about this what what an opportunity in these dark times that we get to stop down stop out of the rat race for a moment and reset um, how we approach things so i would take advantage of this as much again it will i hope it will never happen again in our lifetime and so uh so I'm really, I'm, I think there's going to be a huge uh, gold rush of ideas that come out of this. And so I know someone out there that is listening to this right now has that idea. And so I encourage you to, to do it. And if it doesn't work, it could be your next idea or the one after that. Thank you so much, John. I think that's a perfect place to end. Yeah. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Thank you.